Okay, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, today, is, today is the seventh of Safar, which marks the anniversary of the birthday of Imam Kazim alayhi salam, and according to some narrations, the Shahadat of Imam al Hassan alayhi salam. So, inshallah, with uh, their remembrance and with their tawassul, we embark upon this class and we begin this class, inshallah. There's a beautiful hadith from Imam Ali alayhi salam that says about the Holy Quran. Mm, oh yeah, I think that it's up here, yeah. And know that this Qur'an is an advisor who never deceives, a leader who never misleads, and a narrator who never speaks a lie. No one will sit beside this Qur'an, but that when he rises, he will achieve one addition or one diminu diminution. One thing increasing, one thing decreasing. An addition in his guidance or an elimination in his spiritual blindness. So inshallah, it's a, it's a big tawfiq, it's an opportunity to, to get together and to read the Qur'an, think about the Qur'an. That's really the goal of these classes, inshallah, to just push ourselves because we have this class to you know read the Qur'an, think about it a little bit more. Um, what I had in mind, as you guys must have read in the course description, was that Every day we'll try to go through five of the pages of the Arabic Qur'an. So this famous uh, print of the Qur'an, it's called Uthman Taha, has about 600 pages in the whole Qur'an. So five pages would be approximately one quarter of a juz, a sipara. Of course, at that pace, we're not going to be able to go into a lot of detail and tafsir and explain everything. But... With, the, with that understood, we'll talk about whatever we can, try to look at the themes that are being discussed. If there's a very complicated concept that needs a bit of background, inshallah, to the extent possible, I can uh, try to discuss it. That's, the, that's what I had in mind. I, uh, I started putting together a Google document that maybe if there's interest, we could together work on something like this, where... You know, there's a few different things if we have time we can look at. Of course, time is limited, but uh, one thing is vocabulary, Arabic vocabulary, to the extent... Please, come inside. Welcome. Please come. So, Arabic vocabulary, it's not to go too detail, not things that would require like a deep understanding of Arabic grammar, but to the extent that it affects the meaning. So, for example... When we say Alhamdulillah, what's the difference between Hamd and Shukr? What's the difference between Hamd and Madah? Okay, so it's a limited amount of Arabic vocabulary. Uh, and there are, Alhamdulillah, good resources I have in Farsi that have summarized these things very briefly. So inshallah, before I come to class, I will try to, try to read up on those things a little bit. Then some, maybe some very, again, brief tafsiri points, some lessons that we can take. If together we can actually like work on, on building up a document like this, I think that would be very valuable. It's, uh, it's not something that maybe we have to do, even if we just kind of get together once a week and discuss some of these things, that itself would be beneficial. But if brothers and sisters are interested, I'm, I'm happy to kind of work on such a such a shared document where we're gathering these resources, writing them out. So we have this in the future. Definitely a year from now, we're not going to remember most of what happened in these gatherings. But if we have this document, it can be something that we kind of can go back to and benefit from again and again. In terms of the English translation, I didn't have any tr specific translation in mind. Brothers and sisters can read whatever translation they want. But the one that's available, probably one of the better ones that's available online, is that of Sayyid Quli Qara'i. Also, there are a few copies at the back over there on the shelf. If anybody wants, they can pick up a, a copy of it and, and follow along. So again, an idea that I had was maybe we could kind of have an eye to that translation and at times maybe comment on it. If we feel that something is not that good in that translation, we can be looking at that one. I've heard a lot of praise for some other translations, so I brought them here, but I haven't really looked at them too much. This is a translation done by a Palestinian, um, published by Penguin Classics. 
Apparently, it's a very beautiful translation, like really, really nice English had, has been used to translate the Holy Quran. And this book, I'm sure you guys have heard of it. Please welcome. Yeah, thanks. Welcome. Uh, this is the Study Quran. It was published just a few years ago, headed by Sayyid Hussein Nasser in America. There's an interesting YouTube video that I had watched where he was explaining what they had done, him and one of his students who worked on this. It's really, really a phenomenal work. Of course, as Shias at times, maybe we wouldn't agree with some of his tafsiri points that he concludes, but nonetheless, um, they put in a lot of work into translating and, and kind of bringing together different tafsir opinions in this book. And so I'm sure the translation is a very good translation as well. So if there's any comments or questions, that's what I had in mind, that basically we get together once a week, we try to go through as much of these five pages that we've kind of planned to look at. Today, to be honest, I've only prepared about four pages, but I don't know if we would even get through all of those four pages. Inshallah, whatever we can discuss, we, we can you know try to discuss that. And if you guys have specific questions about verses in this like five pages that you didn't understand, I can try to we can try to discuss it. If things are not clarified, I can try to follow up with other teachers afterwards and, and you know be in touch about that. But inshallah, we try to maintain this pace of every week we're looking at five pages of the Holy Quran. Any other questions, Amir? Yeah, no, I don't know. But I know many years ago in like the 1980s when he was living, I think, in Vancouver, he had published a few volumes. In fact, I probably, my father has it, I think, inside his office there, where it was something similar to what we're planning to do, where he was adding a little bit of explanation to the Holy Quran. Okay. And so it's like a translation with a little bit added. In like parentheses, maybe, he adds a little bit of explanation. So I think he, he finalized that project, but the publication of it is taking a long time. Yeah. Okay, so if there's no comments, I mean, it's, uh, feel free to, you know, comment, question through the course of the, these sessions. If, because it's a big class, if it ends up becoming too much, then maybe I'll limit it, but generally the, the idea is that I'm happy for comments and questions. Are you going to pick a theme? Because you, each week you're going to choose five pages, right? No, no, I thought we just go in order of the Holy Quran. Oh. We start with the beginning, we keep going, and then if there's interest, maybe we can keep going for a long, long period of time even, inshallah. Okay, so without any further ado, inshallah, we can get started with the first page of the Holy Quran. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So the first surah, of course, is Surah Al-Fatiha. Um, yeah, basically one of the things we can talk about, like I said, is going through some of the vocabulary that is there in this Surah Al-Fatiha. And so let's start with that. Of course, Surah Fatiha itself is a very important surah. We have a hadith that, that apparently say that, well, this is another thing that if we work on such a Google document together, maybe we can also gather a hadith, at least a little bit. There's probably many, many a hadith about a surah like Surah Fatiha, but some of the ahadith that are interesting. So, yeah, we have a hadith from the Holy Prophet وآله, that this surah is the best of all surahs in the Holy Quran. We have a hadith from the sixth Imam that if somebody reads this surah 70 times over a dead person, don't be surprised if they come back to life. Just indicating, I guess, the importance and power. We have many different names for this surah. It's called Fatihatul Kitab. It's called Ummul Kitab. It's called Sab'ul Mathani. In another verse of the Holy Quran, there is this term in verse 87 of Surah Hijr, Surah 15. There's a reference to Sab'ul, Sab'ul Mathani. That means the seven things that are repeated twice. Apparently, that's a reference to Surah Fatiha, and then there's different theories of why it's called that. One theory is that in every namaz, we have to read it two times. So that's why it's called the seven things that are repeated twice. Another theory is that it was revealed two times, once in Mecca and once in Medina. Anyways, that's just a little bit of background about the surah itself. 
So to go, also one of the things that I've brought is uh, one of the Hausa students who lives in Vancouver, Sister Fatima Megji, has uh, a course that she offers where she goes through a whole juz of Quran in one session. So in 30 sessions, she goes through the entire Quran. And she has a document where she has kind of written out uh, an overview of the themes of the entire Quran. So I brought that, uh, she shared that with me. So over here she said for Surah Fatiha that we have basically three different themes in this surah. First of all, we're talking about, it's all a discussion of Allah and it's all in the tongue of the believers. Right? It's not Allah talking, it's more like us talking to Allah. Um, and so in the beginning there's a discussion on God and the attributes of God and then our relationship with God and then at the end there is a prayer asking Allah to guide us so these are the three kind of themes of this surah a little bit about some of the important words that come up so the word hamd we normally translate it as praise but there's a difference in Arabic between hamd and shukr, which would also be translated as praise, or hamd and madah. The difference is this, that hamd refers to a praise of just any kind of perfection, whereas shukr has to do with somebody giving you something and then you are thanking them in return for what they gave you. Okay. So there's a subtle difference there. One doesn't necessarily have to do with them giving you something. You've just recognized their perfection and you are praising them. That would be hamd. In terms of hamd versus madah, madah has to do with something that is intentional or unintentional. If somebody has like a good quality in them that they intentionally obtained or unintentionally, they, they look good. Okay, that wasn't in their own volition. They're a good-looking person. You could do madah of them. Whereas hamd is exclusively for something that is intentional. And so in the sense that Allah's perfections are all intentional, we do hamd of him. Okay, so that was a point about hamd. The word Rahman and Rahim, of course, we can't really translate this. You know, in for English, we always say all beneficent, all merciful, or... In, in this um, English translation of that Palestinian academic I was telling you about, he says, merciful to all, compassionate to each. That's how he's translated, Rahman and Rahim. But apparently the, the difference goes back to how Rahman, so, so there's detailed Arabic grammar discussions that you could have here of what kind of a noun this is. We don't want to go into that. But Rahman has this idea of encompassing everything. It is a, like all-encompassing mercy that, yeah, basically encompasses all of creation. Whereas Rahim is a very special kind of mercy that is exclusive for certain people, for the believers, for example. So there's a difference in Rahman, in Rahim, in that sense. When it comes to Malik and other words like Malik, Malik, Mulk, Malakut, one of the points is that, so in, in this verse we have Maliki Yawmiddin or Maliki Yawmiddin. Normally the, the reading that we have is Maliki Yawmiddin, but there are other readings of the Holy Quran that say Maliki. Anyways, Maliki it has this idea of both an owner and possessor and the kind of king or the sovereign of a sovereignty or a kingdom. Apparently it's got both of these meanings together in it. Uh, a side note that's related is that what's the difference between mulk and malakut? Malakut has to do with the kind of sovereignty, the kingdom of both the apparent world and the hidden world. Okay, so mulk is more the apparent kingdom, the apparent rule of Allah, whereas malakut has to do with those spiritual realms that are hidden to us as well. Okay, uh, two last points about ibadah versus ita'ah. Ibadah is this idea of 
um, specifically for Allah, whereas ita'a is just this general idea of obeying. It could be obedience of Allah, it could be obedience of anybody else as well. By the way, like I'm taking this from a Farsi book. At the end of the day, there's going to be like you know detailed opinions on all of these things, primary Arabic sources that you know uh, go into like the root word of every one of these, the th root three letters, and all the other related words and the subtle differences. And uh, studying Arabic language is its own speciality. But there are like simple Farsi books that have done a lot of research. The the author of this has done a lot of research and very kind of easily and simply explained it. So I'm just looking at these to kind of explain it. The last point about Surah Hamd in terms of vocab is what's the difference between Sirat and Sabil? Both of them are similar words that we would translate as path. Both of them come in the Holy Quran. But interestingly enough, you will never find the plural of Sirat. And that goes back to the meaning. Sirat is always just one. Whereas sabil comes in the plural form as well, subul. The idea is that like the idea of like a small alleyway versus like the huge highway. Okay, the, the massive highway of which there's only one, that the goal is to kind of enter on that highway where you're going towards Allah. And when you're on that highway, there's no coming off that highway. That is the sirat. Whereas the subul, there's different small, small paths that you know, you, there can even be paths going in the wrong direction. There can be paths going in the different direction, in, in the right direction, but even different paths. So that's the difference between. Uh, actually, you know, like I was saying, these Arabic words all have like a root meaning that is related to how it's used. So the root meaning of sirat has to do with swallowing. So the idea is that somebody who's on that sirat, it's as if they've been devoured by that path. And like their whole life now is just in the path of servitude to Allah and obedience to Allah. Okay, so that's some of the important words in this in this blessed surah. Um, a few lessons or a few last points to do with Surah Fatiha. It's interesting to note that we all recite it all the time in surah in, in our namaz and it has the plural form being used in these verbs iyaka na'budu you alone do we worship so maybe we can say that there, there's a lesson there about the importance of praying in congreg congregation or the importance of the muslim ummah that we think of ourselves as one community um there is a hadith about the importance of Bismillah. Anything that you start without saying the the Bismillah, the sentence Bismillah is gonna be like incomplete or you know it lacks on certain blessings. It's yeah. Apparently we have a hadith that says from the Holy Prophet that any work that is started without saying Bismillah is naqas. It won't finish, it won't reach the end. That's the importance of the word Bismillah, the sentence Bismillah. Um, what is intended by the verse when it says "an'amta alayhim"? Those people who you have blessed. We can maybe understand this by looking at another verse of the Holy Quran, which talks and tells us exactly who is a blessed person. In Surah An Nisa, it says, "Whoever obeys Allah and the Apostle, they are those with whom though they are those they are with." those whom Allah has blessed. Who are those that Allah has blessed? The prophets, the truthful, the martyrs, and the righteous. The nabiyun, the siddiqun, the shuhada, and the salihun. Yeah, we can, there's like, maybe we can get an idea of the importance of a role model when we see such verses that, you know, we're asking Allah to keep us on the path of those, there are always those eminent role models in history and even in our times who represent the perfect, perfection and the path of servitude to Allah. Another interesting point is that if you look at the Arabic, we have this idea of verbs that are ma'loom and majhul. I don't know if the English translation would be active and passive, but 
when it comes to an'amta alayhim, it's active, if that's the right translation. The idea being that Allah blessed them. There are certain people who Allah blessed, and the, the, the doer of the action is Allah. Whereas when it comes to those who went astray, it says, مَغْضُوبِ alayhim and ضَالِّينَ Here, it's not saying that Allah misguided them. It's saying that they themselves were, they incurred the wrath of Allah. They themselves went astray. So it's not attributing it to Allah. As if that's the lesson for us that, you know, people who go astray, they're going astray because they themselves are the cause of that. It's not Allah that misguided them. Okay, so these are some points about Surah Hamd. We move on now to Surah Baqarah. If there's no questions or comments, yeah, there are. Please go ahead. Discussions and I don't quite understand how they said that, that Alameen might refer to only intellectual worlds. You know what I'm referring to? Mm-hmm. I'm not, I, haven't, I'm not, I haven't looked into that much detail. In this symbol of seer I have here, it says all of creation. The plural of Adam, um, yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah, okay, so this is taken. This is a simple Farsi tafsir that has self basically looked at more complicated tafsir and gathered points. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it has a point here about the word Adamin, that creations of Allah are called Adam because they are an alama. They are like an indication of the creator himself. So now the plural of these created beings would be Alamin. Now this is the, it's taken from one linguistic kind of tafsir. And so maybe that's the opinion of the author of that tafsir, that Adameen means all created beings. But maybe other people have explained it the way you said as well, yeah. I'm sure you, your brothers and sisters know that like, you know, there's many, many tafsir work that have been written in history. And many of our ulama, like they approach tafsir from one angle. So one of them was an expert in Arabic grammar and his tafsir is a tafsir of Arabic grammar, basically. Many of them are tafsir of hadith. All that person did, which was a very beneficial, important work, was he gathered all the hadith of the Ahlul Bayt to do with this ayah. And so in the order of the whole Qur'an, he gathered all of the hadith. Like that, we have many, many different tafsir. But uh, yeah, in the interest of time, we can't go into a lot of these details. Sorry, sorry Mason. Go ahead, Mason. Um, so, growing up, I always understood the last part of the surah to mean like there's three groups of people. There's the one that Allah has blessed, that we want to be with, um, the ones that uh, incurred his wrath, and then there's the ones that are, who are astray, the last two are trying to not be like them. But when I was reading the translation of Sayyid Ali Ibn Qaraib, and especially the footnote, you mm-hmm. made a comment that um, the common way we re- recite this verse with a kasra on ghayril, it's not a dubi alayhim, it almost means like it's not three different groups of people, it's all one group of people. Guide us to the straight path of the ones you have blessed, who are the ones mm-hmm. who have not incurred your wrath, and they are also the ones who are not astray. So it's like three descriptions of the same group of people, and I was kind of surprised by that because that's yeah, not how yeah. I like, like yeah, wrote yeah. doing it. Um, is that, like, I trust Sayyid Ali Khuli and his, his, yeah, uh, yeah. his understanding, but like, um, like, is this a common understanding? It's something I can take and look at, inshallah. But I, I would assume that you could, the, the, what seems to come to my mind is the natural reading of Arabic would be as he's saying, that like there's no wow between them. It's one group, that alladina, what are the attributes of alladina? That they have all three. But that's not to say like Arabic is very like flexible as well. And maybe sometimes you can describe three different groups of people without the wow between them. And so even like what I've always heard is that there's three different groups of people. Even these tafasir that I was looking at, I'm pretty sure that they've talked about it. Yeah. We have a hadith as well that like at times, but see these hadith are not also like the only understanding we can get. It's not, sometimes these hadith are giving us one of the different meanings that the ayat has. So we have a hadith apparently that say that dalin um, are the Christians and maghdub alayhim are the Jews. Yeah. Okay. Uh, oh yeah, uh, Ali. Uh, uh, question. Uh, yeah, Sheikh. Now, if there is a Sirat or Mustaqim, 
Um, I've heard two versions of that, keep us on the, on the straight path versus guide us on the straight path. Yeah, and of course, yeah. that was an argument that was made against our brothers who, when right, this right. is recited, they say, say Amin, Amin yeah, yeah. versus Alhamdulillah. No, it's a dua for everybody. Even we should say, like, we can say, but uh, in our fiqh, to say Amin is not allowed. That would invalidate our namaz. It's one of the sha'air of the Ahl sunnah okay. Anyways, that's, that's a side point. <coughs> mm, but uh, I think that, like, uh, there is this idea of sirat being that path of servitude to Allah, that path that once we're on it okay that doesn't mean that there's no room for perfection constantly but if we are on it then we want to remain on it right and so then ihdina maybe can also mean for certain people who have reached that goal keep us on the straight path okay. of course that doesn't mean that there's no room for perfection everybody has infinite amount of improvement and perfection Okay, so moving on, the second page of the Qur'an. There's a discussion of huruf al-muqatti'at. Mm. Yeah, basically 29 surahs of the Holy Qur'an begin with these letters. There's 14 different letters that are used. You all know this, I'm sure. Many of them are alif, lam, meem. Many of them are Ham, Meem, Alif, Lam, Ra. Surah Maryam begins with Kaf, Haya, Ain, Sad. So what is the secret behind these letters? Like it's not a word, it's just a letter that we're reading out. There are many different theories, two of which are that it is just a secret that we don't have any knowledge of, we don't have any access to. That's one theory. And we have a hadith that support this theory as well as the second theory. The second theory, which is a very nice one, is that it's a kind of reminder to human beings that the Qur'an, with all of its miraculous nature and its beauty and all of its guidance and knowledge and everything, it's a miracle, but at the end of the day, it consists of the same letters that you human beings use. And so it's kind of a lesson for people. And one of the things that strengthens this argument is that all of the surahs that have these huruf al muqatti'at the very next verse is talking about the Qur'an, except for one. Surah Ali Imran, it's like there's one thing, and then after that, the verse after is talking about the Qur'an. So that indicates that maybe these huruf al muqatti'at are something to do with the greatness of the Qur'an itself. And so then it fits with that second explanation. Yeah, for... We have from uh, from Imam Sajjad salam, we have a hadith that says exactly something like this that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Alif Lam Mim Dalik al Kitab meaning that this book that was revealed is made of these same Arabic Alif Ba letters basically that you speak with. So if if you if you don't want to disbelieve, if you claim that it's just the words of a normal human being, then bring something like this. And and that challenge will come in these opening pages of Surah Baqarah as well. Okay, so that was one point. Um, the opening 20 verses, so like the second, third, and part of the fourth page of the Holy Qur'an is talking about three groups of people. Initially, on page 2 of the Qur'an, there's a discussion of the believers, the pious people, muttaqun. Then there's like two verses only about the kuffar, the disbelievers. And then there's a lengthy discussion about the hypocrites, the munafiqun. And there's two parables that are a bit difficult to understand that we'll, we'll look at, that are giving a parable of who the munaf, very strong imagery is used to describe the hypocrites, the munafiqun. Okay, but again, very quickly looking at some of the words that are used in the first, uh, the second page of the Holy Quran. It says, "Dalik al kitabu la rayba fi." What's the word "rayb"? Rayb means it's like shak, but there's a subtle difference there. So both of them mean doubt, 
But shock is just simply doubt, like 50-50. I don't know, is it this way or that way? I'm in doubt. Rabe comes along with a bit of like a accusation and like, I doubt that it's true, so I'm thinking negatively about it. Okay, subtle difference there. Um, what's the difference between Hidayat and Irshad? So we have this idea of Khuda, Khudan lil Muttaqin. The Quran is guidance. Irshad would also be called guidance, but again, there's a subtle difference there where Irshad is taking somebody to Rushd, which is their perfection, their perfect state. Whereas guidance can be in a good sense, in a divine sense, or even in a bad sense. It's just like you're pointing them the way they have to go. We have people who can guide you to the fire of hell. And the word hidayat could be used for that as well. Okay? Another point is, what's the difference between muttaqi and mu'min? I think we have an idea that mu'min is simply a believer. Whereas muttaqi has this idea of taqwa, of acting on that belief, obeying Allah. Mm, there is in fact another word, yeah. So we're going to come in the next page to the difference between tughyan and kufr. Okay, I think the word tughyan comes on the next page. We'll see somewhere. Um, anyways, the, the, yeah, it says in the next page, verse 15, it says, Allahu yastahazi'u bihum wa yamudduhum fi tughyanihim. So it's the same idea that tughyan is the bad actions that result from the kufr, the disobedience. Here, taqwa is the piety and that being on the right course of action because of the iman. So iman and kufr are to do with the belief and the disbelief for us. Tughyan and taqwa are to do with the actions. Rizq, as you know, rizq is this idea of sustenance. It's, it doesn't have to just mean wealth. I don't think you'll find a hadith and du'as where the imams prayed for money. But again and again they pray for rizq. Somebody's knowledge, somebody's family, somebody's spirituality, all of this, sa safety, health, all of this could be a kind of risk. And so in describing the believers, that's a very beautiful point, that the believers, the pious people, are those who give in what God gave them of the risk. It doesn't necessarily mean wealth. Somebody might not have money, but he has other skills, he has time, he has compassion that he can share with people. That's a kind of risk that he can give. Um, what's the difference between inzal and tanzil? So again and again we see these words in the Quran. The Quran unzila, okay, it was sent down. But sometimes we see nuzila, again sent down. Unzila comes from the word anzala, the noun of that would be inzal. And nazala, the noun of that would be tanzil. These are Arabic grammar points, but the, the subtle difference there is that and this might not always apply in the Qur'an, but generally the difference in the two Arabic words are Nasala means gradually descended. So the Qur'an was gradually descended in that it was given to the Holy Prophet over that period of 23 years. But the idea of like in one instance when it comes down, that is Inzal. Yaqeen and Iman, again, I think you know Iman is like faith, whereas Yaqeen is a higher level of certainty, of you know having witnessed that surety that you have from witnessing something, that would be Yaqeen. So believers in these verses are described as having Yaqeen in the hereafter. وَبِالْآخِرَةِهُمْ يُقِنُونَ and a last point about falah and fawz and najat. So in this word, we, in this end of page two, we have that the believers are those who are muflihun. All of them we would say in English as successful. But there are subtle differences here between falah and najat and fawz. So both... Um, Oh, it went off? Okay. I uh, didn't plug it in. Maybe I should, but for now, it's, it's come back, right? No. Yeah. Okay. So, both falah and najat 
have to do with like being saved from something bad. Whereas foes doesn't have that idea of something bad that you are saved from. It just means you're in like a happiness, a state of happiness. Foes, okay? So what's the difference between falah and najat? Falah is this idea that like you're in a state of happiness where now nothing can disturb you. You've reached like spiritual perfection. There's no room for any problem. Whereas najat could be like, okay, I didn't get hit by this car, but I might get hit by another car. Like, you know, something went good, but there's still potential for something else to go wrong. So falah is like a, a higher level. Okay, that's page two. Again, page two was talking about, oh yeah, some, some lessons. Uh, interesting to note that it says, ذَلِكَ kitab. One of the maybe points there is that it's illustrating the grandness of the Holy Quran, that it's so far away. And that's why I, in this translation of Sayyid Quli Qarai that was online, by the way, the translation has been updated. So what's on this website, tanzil.info, I don't know if it's the second version. I, I won't be surprised if it's the first version. This is a very nice website, by the way, tanzil.net. It has many, many translations of the Quran, recitations of the Quran in different languages. So here in the translation that I got, it said, this is the book. But actually the Arabic is ذَلِكَ kitab. ذَلِكَ would be that, something far away. And in other verses about the Qur'an, it says هَذَا. Okay, so why in some verses is it saying this, and in other verses it says that? It could be that like over here, Allah wants to emphasize this point about like, it's such a grand thing. It's, it's so far away from us. We're so lowly, it's so grand. So that book. Okay? But in other verses, maybe that idea of being close to it, being intimate, it's available to us, is being emphasized. Okay, um, that was one kind of lesson we could take from this. Um, so where you've highlighted in the translation and made comments, are those... Um, yeah, it was just thoughts that came to my mind that, okay, like, God weary, what does that mean? This is something that, like I said, if brothers and sisters are interested, we could slowly work on, like, not maybe going into too much detail, but writing out some of these thoughts. W at times, these English words, are we clear exactly the meaning? If we say Lord, for we didn't talk about Rabb, but what does the word Lord mean? Definitely there's Christian connotations there, but even is the meaning correct? So these are things that uh, at times I was just thinking about it and I highlighted it for that reason. Yeah. Okay, for, for that particular verse where it says it's the guidance for the um, Muttaqeen. Ahsan, yeah. Or, uh, that, so I was, gonna, that, or I was about to say that, okay. but yeah. No, but you say what, ask the question first. No, like, yeah. it, like, isn't it supposed to be or shouldn't it be yeah, a guidance for yeah. the Ahsan. So there is another verse even in Surah Baqarah where it says, Shahru Ramadan alladhi unzila fihi al-Quran and then it says, Hudan lin nas guidance for mankind, for people. So what's the explanation? I think it would be explained uh, along these lines that like there's, uh, it's intended or it's available for all of mankind, but those people who actually take advantage of it, obey Allah, they will achieve the true kind of guidance that it has to offer. Yeah. Um, in that regard, there's another verse that I put the address of here in Surah Isra that says that the Qur'an is in fact a misguidance for the bad people. وَنُنَزِّلُ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ مَا هُوَ شِفَاءٌ وَرَحْمَةٌ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَلَا يَزِيدُ الظَّالِمِينَ إِلَّا خَسَارًا so The Qur'an even can be the cause of misguidance for the bad people. Um, yeah, some other lessons that I, I got in some of these books was that like لَا رَيْبَ فِيهِ There should be no doubt in it. So that shows that the Qur'an is so like clear, the truth of it is so clear that anybody who doesn't believe in it is actually just being stubborn and they're refusing to accept what is actually clear. It's interesting that the Quran is called guidance. It is itself like um, the Arabic word, so this is like an Arabic grammar point, is it doesn't call it hadi, it calls it huda, hudan, which normally is incorrect, but there's a point there that either Either it's saying that like it's an extremely strong kind of guide, or it's it's like you know there's a point there. That it's not just a guide; it is guidance itself. Anyways, yeah. Um, in this uh, verse in Surah Al-Waqi'ah, where it talks about uh, 
إنه لقرآن كريم في كتاب المكنون لا يمسه إلا المطهرون. So مطهرون is is it referring to those purified by Allah yeah. and those who can't touch it, or what's it got to do with those? Who, if you could just shed a bit of light, because in connection to his question, guidance for everybody, but mm-hmm. only those mm-hmm. can touch its meaning and its. The word mutahharun would be those who are purified. Indicating like a very high level that Allah has purified them. Um, so I, I'm guessing it means something along the lines of like that higher reality of what the Quran is, or some you know s- special kind of guidance, special benefit of the Holy Quran that's only available for a certain group of people. Yeah. Okay. Let's try to do page three and four if we can. So in the interest of time, we'll end at nine o'clock even if we don't finish. But I'll go through page three quickly because I want to come to page four where there is those two parables. So basically, page three is talking about the two verses about the kuffar and how God put a seal on their heart. What does that mean? Like, we, of course, we don't believe in predestination. It's they themselves who chose to disobey. But maybe there is a mix. We believe in, like, you know, not totally predestination, but not totally free will either. That somebody can commit so many sins and go against the truth, and then they reach a level where, like, their heart has been sealed by Allah. That's it. Like, they chose to go down this path. There's no coming back for them. Right? Although, I mean, if anybody who does tawbah, God will forgive them for sure. But the reality of the way the universe works is like that, that somebody can commit such crimes that now there's no way that they themselves will ever choose to come back. Anyways. Um, so, um, is that more to do with just like the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has like constructed the universe to work? Not that he's like, you know, directly placing a seal on someone's heart, but just that the way that he's constructed the world, they've kind of chosen that path and now as a result their, their heart has yeah. been sealed. Definitely, it wouldn't be just for Allah to punish somebody if it wasn't their own fault, right? right. So we be- definitely believe, believe it was their own fault. But I think there also is this idea of like, yeah, just the way things work are like that. That you can make your heart so black that then, mm-hmm. that's it, there's no... R- like we have a hadith that God will never forgive the killer of Imam Hussein, for example. But how do we understand these hadith? Mm-hmm. If, if Shimmer, Lanatullah, Yazid, Lanatullah, had done tawbah, would God have forgave them? It's, I think it's understood more like this That like You know you can become Such an evil person now That The way things work Is that you never change then like. Okay so two verses About the kuffar And then it begins This long discussion About the munafiqun That they say That we believe But they don't actually believe They want to deceive Allah They are They have a sickness In their heart And then it's very interesting Like we see People like this today in the world, don't we? Like people who, you tell them, they're told that don't do fasad, don't cause mischief and corruption in the earth. And they say, no, we stand for human rights and we we're, we we're believe in human rights and, you know, like we're, we're good people, we're not bad people. But you look at what their countries are doing and the crimes they're committing and you see that very clearly they are not good people. So these are how the munafiqun are being described. Um... It has this point that Allah does a mockery of them. Allah who yastahazi ubihim. Interesting point that they, they so these hypocrites are described at the end of this page as being very close to the kuffar. That they pretend to be the, with the believers, but what their real friends, when they go in those like private gatherings with the kuffar, they tell the kuffar that no, no, we're really with you. Okay? This is interesting in itself, that the hypocrites and the disbelievers are like one group. And then there's this other interesting point that like, so the hypocrites say to the disbelievers, no, we were just making, a, making fun, like making a mockery when we pretended to be believers. And then it says, Allah who yastahazi ubihim, that God derides them or, you know, mocks them. What does it mean that God mocks them? These are things to think about. I, I don't have an answer maybe right now, but... Of course, we have to understand this within our belief, our theology of, you know, Allah and who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. Uh, yeah, yeah, please. Uh, go ahead. Uh, there's a sickness in their heart and then Allah introduces Ahsan. Yes, yes. Yeah. So, um, 
just wondering, so when, you know, they're already corrupting, yeah, and then yeah. God increases yeah, their, yeah. you know, darkness of their heart. Right. Then w- they continue to do even more, so can Allah, I mean, I just wanted to understand. Asant, Asant. In this, these t- brief tafas here I was looking at, they referred to, in answering that question, they referred to this verse in Surah Al-Isra, where it, it says such things that whoever wants the hereafter, Allah will help them, basically. Or Allah will appreciate it. And um, Basically, the idea in this these verses of Surah Isra, the 17th chapter of the Quran, is that whatever path you're going on, God will help you in that path. If you're going towards goodness and piety and servitude to Allah, Allah will help you. But if you go down the wrong path even, <laughs> there will be some kind of like, you yourself will be maybe pulled further and further da- along that path. So it's a complicated discussion that maybe we can't even fully understand with our intellect. It's more like higher realities that need to be understood through piety. But the idea is that it's not predestination, nor is it free will. The Ahlul Bayt would say it's Amrun Baina Amrain. There's some reality that's between these two that we have a role to play that God gave us this free will. It was imposed upon us. We have to use it. And then when we use it, there's a whole system of cause and effect in this world. One part of it is my free will. There are all these other things as well. You know, like the dua of my mother and I don't know, the waswasa of shaitan and all these things also affect my course of action okay so let's in the interest of time let's go to the fourth page now so in the beginning of the fourth page there are two parables that are given of these hypocrites that I think are a little bit difficult to understand so let's try to read them and make sense of them Apparently, the first parable is to do with belief, whereas the second parable is to do with action. But both of them are to do with a hypocrite. So I'll just read the uh, English translation. It says, Their parable is that of of one who lighted a torch, and when it had lit up all around him, Allah took away their light and left them sightless in a manifold darkness. They are deaf, dumb, and blind. Dumb meaning they can't talk, right? And they will not come back. So this is an example of the munafiqun, as if they had lit some kind of light. There was light for them to traverse a path. But when they had kindled that torch and lit that up, Allah put it out. Okay, so the example is like that of maybe like a a storm. And so somebody lit like a candle and then like a gust of wind came and again they're in the darkness. How does that apply to a hypocrite? Apparently the explanation is this, that by accepting Islam overtly, they were in the light. They were like benefiting as a believer, as a Muslim. They, people could, you know, they were not najis. They were like allowed to like interact with believers, marry believers and... They were part of that community in this world of believers. So they were in the light. But when they die, they will be, because they were hypocrites, they didn't really believe. And so when they die, that light will be put out and they will be treated as if they are disbelievers. Okay, so that's the explanation apparently. The second parable. Sorry, I have a general question. Sure, sure. So in in general, when we have analogies, in, in my opinion, they're supposed to make things easier to understand. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it seems yeah. in the Quran uh, that, that several of the analogies are like they're not different. easily understood that's at that's all. That's is there a reason for that? Like the Quran overall, this is a comment that actually I was thinking maybe I should mention in the beginning. I remember vividly that once I was talking to a, a brother um, who had come for ziyarat, and he was just commenting to me that the Quran is so difficult to understand. It's not like the Bible where you can just read it and it reads like a storybook. So there's some wisdom there where God wanted us to kind of struggle to understand the Qur'an. Certain things were not made very obvious. And in that, definitely, there's like benefit for us. Yeah. I don't know <laughs> more than that. Okay. So the second parable, again, let's read it. The, 
or that, or that meaning another parable, or that of a rainstorm from the sky, wherein is darkness, thunder, and lightning. They put their fingers in their ears due to the thunder claps, apprehensive of death, and Allah besieges the faithless. Okay, so we're, we have this example of somebody who's like walking in a thunderstorm. There's a lot of rain, it's dark, there's thunder, lightning. They're so scared of the lightning that they're putting their ears, their fingers in their ears to not hear the, the sound of the thunder. And then there's this bright lightning that's coming that's like so bright that they can, the lightning almost snatches away their sight. But when the lightning comes for a moment, there is some light that they can see because there's this thunder, so it's, it's normally dark. And so when that light comes, then they can walk a little bit. And then when again the lightning is gone and it's dark, then they're just standing. And then Allah says that had Allah willed, He could have taken away their hearing and their sight. So how is this <coughs> how is this an example for the hypocrites? Like I said, apparently the last example was more to do with belief, whereas here it has to do with action. <coughs> So it's as if these hypocrites are travelers uh, in, 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 in this thunderstorm. <coughs> One second. Yeah. So it's like because they were part of the believing community in this world, you know, just being with the believers, they took some steps towards kind of the, the goal of being a believer, being a servant of Allah. But when their hypocrisy was unveiled, then they kind of stood still. Okay, so this is the kind of explanation that I'm reading here in this Farsi. Um, that with their apparent belief that they had in the, in the community of believers, it's as if they were taking some steps forward. They were doing some of the right actions. They were pretending to pray namaz or fast or something like that. But when their hypocrisy was kind of unveiled, then it's as if they stopped. Yeah, okay, so that was one explanation. I'll just check if I have another explanation that might be uh, better. So, he, a hypocrite does not like Islam, he has to profess to be a Muslim, his words do not reach his heart. What he says is different from what he believes. There's a discrepancy there, right? What he says is different from what he really believes. So he ha it's like this person who's aimlessly walking in the storm. He doesn't know where he's going. He's groping around in the dark. So that's the example of a hypocrite, that he walks a bit and he's, he's stuck. He walks a little bit, he stumbles. He's not really getting to any destination. Okay, same idea of a hypocrite, that he's following some of the sharia, because he's pretending to be a believer. So it's as if he's taking some steps, but he's not really getting to the destination. He takes a bit of uh, steps forward, and then he's stopping to move. Okay? These are the two examples we had of the disbelievers. Inshallah, those are some points to do with the first four pages. Well, I think we'll just skip over the fifth page, and like I said, in our, our goal to kind of finish five pages uh, a week, Inshallah, those uh, dear brothers and sisters who can make it, for next week, we can continue from page 6 onwards, inshallah. Um, I'm, I'm here, I can stick around for any questions, comments, but uh, overall, this was what we had in mind. Um, inshallah, if anybody has any serious, like, you know, reservations or problems with this approach, do let me know. We'll see if we can accommodate for it. But yeah, the plan was, like I, I said initially, that we want to continue in this way, uh, as the registration was, was for the, till the month of November. At that point, we'll see if brothers and sisters feel it was very beneficial, then we can, inshallah, keep going. And even if I'm not in town, we could do it online. I I'm probably not going to be in town after November. Anyways, wa sallallahu ala muhammadin wa alihi al-tayyibin al-tahirin. Thank you. If I may, uh, to make a suggestion. Yeah, sure, sure. So the first two pages that we covered today were... Very small, like yeah. seven, seven, eight. Percent. Time on them. No, and 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 we only got through one other page.
Yeah, and yeah. going forward, the, the content is going to be m more in five pages. Yeah, yeah, is yeah. it possible to reduce the pace to maybe two or three pages just so that we're covering the content? So this is, uh, like, I'd like to get everybody's opinion, but what we had in mind was, like, even if we go at five pages, it's going to take us more than two years to finish the Qur'an. And part of the goal here is just to give us a push to read the Qur'an, think about the Qur'an, not just about, ex we're not going to be able to explain everything. So... Personally, I'm okay with sacrificing on that so that we reach this goal. In the future, maybe, or with other you know, classes, or maybe in the future even here, we can then go through things more in more detail and more slowly, trying to make sure everything is understood. But yeah, I'm open for other feedback as well, if others insist. <coughs> yeah, sure. Uh, so I just wanted to clarify, so the thought was to kind of, at high level, touch the major themes, yeah, and yeah. then be able to kind of move on, yeah. rather than doing that. Yeah. And so, so like these uh, themes that Sister Fatima Benji has put together, at the very least, uh, I can provide that, make that available to you guys, even if we don't work on this kind of a Google document. So we get the bigger picture of the Quran, like surah by surah, with juz by juz, what are the discussions that are being discussed. Anybody wants to stay, otherwise you guys can take it easy.